Hello, and welcome to this second episode in this podcast series. My name is Brian McKittrick, and I will be examining and explaining the importance of the communication between game developers and their players, and how this in turn affects the public perception of the two. On our last episode, we looked at the basic concepts behind player-developer dialogue, as well as took a look at Gaslamp Games and how, through communication with their players, they built up a positive reputation with many online communities. In today's episode, we will touch on some more ways in which developers and players can communicate, as well as look at another developer to show the effect of these methods on their public image. When it comes to funding game development, the options are rather limited. If a developer does not already have their own personal source of funds from previous titles they made, more than likely they form a contract with a publishing company to invest in their projects. In exchange for providing the initial investment to the developer, the publisher has some control over deadlines, release dates, and, and other elements of the project's development cycle. The degree to which the publisher has control over the developer's project is different for each pairing of publishers and developers, with some publishers giving almost free reign to the developer while others are very involved in the project, sometimes in a detrimental fashion. You see a lot of publishers work with the same developers over and over, and they form a relationship this way. And sometimes you have publishers that are also developers at the same time. The method, this method of funding is somewhat limited, however, to studios of a certain size, and there are very few examples of small, independent developers getting backing from huge publishing companies. That is why indie developers most often work on their own time and often invest much of their own money in the project. This in turn limits the scope and complexity of indie games, which is why they are usually smaller in comparison to games from AAA developers backed by well-known publishers. Recently, however, there is a trend that is showing how indie developers can get monetary support without having to tie themselves to a publisher, as well as providing us with another form of player-developer communication. This, is a, this method, of course, is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is a fairly recent system of supporting projects through public funding, allowing people to back potential projects they have an interest in. Sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo are among the largest crowdfunding systems, with Kickstarter just recently reaching $1 billion in pledges to thousands of creative projects, not just video games. Many of these projects are video games, and, is, and what is interesting is th about these systems is how they allow backers to have a say in how the game is developed, beyond just providing the necessary funding in the first place. Project creators can offer reward tiers for different pledge amounts, with incentives like copies of the game, artwork, extra game content, and other rewards for higher donations. They can also offer stretch goals that go beyond the initial funding goal, which can allow for the expansion of the complexity and scope of the game further still. Crowdfunded games also give us a good opportunity to see another way in which developers and players can interact. Not every project on these sites is successfully funded. So, in a sense, players decide what comes out next by voting with their money. Some projects go the extra mile and give a chance for backers to vote for more than just that. The Skullgirls Kickstarter, which was to fund the first DLC character, had stretch goals for additional characters that would come later. After these, were, these goals were met within a few days of the Kickstarter just beginning, backers at or above a certain tier then got the chance to vote on the next two DLC characters from a large pool of potentials. In this way, players were given the ability to have a direct hand in what content made its way into the game. Now that we have an idea of how crowdfunding can serve as a form of communication, let us get right into discussing this episode's developer. Another studio based in Canada, this developer made a name for itself with its first game released in 2006. This game has, was a new entry into the genre of 4X strategy games, 4X standing for Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate. It also featured a real-time tactical combat system where you could command your fleets and blow up the opposition with a variety of weaponry. The base game was released with four races to choose from, each with their own unique playstyle, and the two expansions added two more races. This game is Sword of the Stars, and it is the first game that was developed by Kerberos Productions Incorporated. But what this developer has to do with the concept of crowdfunding comes much later. Kerberos, after their initial, after their initial success with Sword of the Stars, went on to make a completely different game, Fort Zombie, which was a third-person zombie survival game. Compared to their first game, it did not fare as well, and was plagued with several game-breaking bugs for a long time. 
However, their third game is probably their most famous, or infamous. Sword of the Stars 2 was announced in 2010 and released on October 28, 2011, and was billed as a bigger, better, and more complex game than, their, than the first entry. Unfortunately, due to various issues, possibly involving the release date, the version of the game that was released was a pre-alpha build, one that no one could actually play. Kerberos quickly apologized for the mistake, but the version they then put out afterwards was only a marginal improvement. Bugs of all kinds still plagued the game, and it took a full two years until Kerberos announced that the game was finally patched to their satisfaction, eliminating such problems as asteroids kidnapping your admirals, the sound not working, and the continue button not actually doing what it's supposed to. Even though Kerberos cleaned up their game as best they could, the damage to their reputation was already done. As discussed in the previous episode, if a small development studio wants to have a have popular support, they need to stay on top of bugs and issues in their game in order to keep players happy. The evidence that shows that Kerberos lost their players' support can be seen in how they funded their next game. Sword of the Stars The Pit was their third game set in their original IP setting, but this time they were going to make a roguelike, much like we discussed last time as well, and they were going to do it without the financial support of their longtime publisher, Paradox Interactive. Kerberos instead used crowdfunding in order to fund their game. I managed to get in touch with the CEO of Kerberos and ask him a few questions about his experiences as a game developer. Why don't you introduce yourself? I am Martin Serlis, uh, CEO and Creative Director at Kerberos Productions. All right. And you've been working with game design for how long? I've been a game designer in the industry since 1999. I was a journalist for the industry for about five years before that. And you worked on games like uh, Homeworld, right? Yep. I was lead writer and did some light campaign mission design for Homeworld. And then uh, a, a full-on designer on Homeworld Cataclysm. What is your opinion of modding communities in general? Like, communities that form around creating and sharing mods? Um, I have a very working person's view of them in the sense that the ones who are doing the actual work I find pretty amazing and fabulous um, but I find a lot more of people talking the talk but not walking the walk if you see what I mean. They sort of leech off of everyone else? Leech off of everybody else, tweak a couple of effects, claim they redid the effects, right? That sort of thing, right? Okay. Um, I find that the modding community and the wider modding community is, is fueled by a certain mythology surrounding certain key modding moments like Counter-Strike, um, that sort of thing. And that affects actually the industry itself quite a bit too. That mythology is built into a lot of production decisions. What about the, the community for your games that mod, or the modding community in your official forums? Um, it's okay, it's generally quiet. I won't say, while our games are data-driven, they're not the most modder-friendly. Mm -hmm. So uh, it takes a slightly higher-tiered, uh, skilled modder to do that. Um, we allowed for SOTS 1. We uh, responded to the community and told them that if they as a group could come up with a new race, we would help them mod it into the game instead of just swapping out one of the existing races. Um, but it was on the condition that they get it all up and running and all the models made and that sort of stuff. And then once they were done, we would do the rest for them. Uh, it never got that far, mm. unfortunately. And if you go on our board, you can still see the remnants there. It, uh, was, died. Was, a, was allowing oh, for modding a, uh, a goal or feature in any of your games that you made? Yes, um, as much as possible. The line we drew, since we were a very small team, was that we would do as much as we could without putting ourselves behind schedule. Mm -hmm. okay, um, so. What about fee or systems like uh, Steam Workshop? Uh, if yep. those had been around back then when you were first making games, would you have tried to incorporate them? Oh, definitely. Right. That's just Steam in general that had been around when we first started. It made a difference on a number of fronts, but certainly the workshop, for sure. And our products from now on will take into account the workshop. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about um, 
let's plays and uh, people recording commentary over over recording games, not just oh, your games, but in general. Yeah. Oh, they're great. Like, they're, they are a source of uh, much pride, some amusement, a little bit of horror. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're an amazing new phenomenon. Do you feel like uh, after having seen Let's Plays for some of your recent games that you feel like you can incorporate ideas from them into newer games? Um, not as much because most Let's Plays are actually really just involved in playing the game. Um, it brings out more of an idea of what I want to concentrate more in for other games. So if I was going to work on The Pit 2, I definitely like going through the Let's Plays and finding all those guys' old oh crap moments where they freak out where they're playing and go, how can I put more of those into the game? Because those are very satisfying for the player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or while that turned out to be really repetitious or tedious for a player or a certain kind of player, what can I do to speed that up or clean that up a bit? So they're very useful that way. Um, speaking of the pit or ground powders, it's very much a departure from Sword of the Stars and yep. the other games you've done before. Uh, what was the, what were the reasons behind doing these games? Um, the reason was, first of all, that we've always planned on doing um, other games within the Sword of the Stars universe, but not the same game. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you look over my career, you see that I tend to. Uh, like to do different kind of games far more than the average designer does um, Yes, I've done a few space combat games, but I've also done a zombie third-person game um, And a various other designs. I've got a war game with ground pounders a uh, rogue with uh, the pits um, I've always been a big fan of the pit no, not but of rogues in general. I play them a lot way way back in the ancient days um when we were at the place we were in, we were just wrapping up work trying to fix SOTS 2 and stepping uh, away from uh, from the idea that publishing partner stuff was reliable or safe for a small company, which as it turns out, it's not. So we needed to step out on our own. And the pit was designed as both a departure and as a very achievable product for the small portion of the team I had available at the time. You didn't have the entire team? No, the entire team was finishing up work on SOTS 2. Oh, okay. We had a commitment to uh, our player base to try and do as much cleanup work as possible even after the publisher stopped paying for it. Mm. Is that why the pit and ground pounders were through uh, ground, or crowdsourcing or crowdfunding? Yep. yep. They are the ways, ways of us building a new business model. And you prefer crowdfunding through Indiegogo and Kickstarter over having a publisher? Yes, because it's completely, once it's there, I know completely what's going on. I can see going, you set up a crowdfunding campaign, you don't know how much for sure you will get, but you can design a game to take that into account, various scales of money. Whereas when you're Working for a publisher, it's completely up for grabs. They can change the rules any time on it. And that makes uh, steady design and steady staffing very difficult. So being fully indie is no more risky and a lot more reliable in the long run. Over what all you've said, I mean, what would be considered the biggest challenge you face as a game designer? Uh, uh, with Kerberos, at least. Um. Hmm. <laughs> like deadlines, publishers, something like that. Uh, without a doubt, publishing and financing is the greatest challenge. Um, that makes life very uh, unreliable. And like I said, when that control is not in your hands, then you have no control over things like release times and things like that. Mm hmm. Um, and also, but in general, it's hard work. Right? We, uh, as a design studio, we put out quite a bit more games than the average company does. We've been together 10 years. We've put out, well, we're about to put out our fourth full game. And we've done, what, a half dozen expansions over that period of time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, 14 product releases in 10 years. That's, uh, that's rewarding, but it is uh, strenuous work. Are you going to continue using crowdfunding as a, uh, a form of uh, funding for, for future games? Yeah, indeed. That is now the standard model that we will work from. We will put together proposals, we will pitch them to the public, we will see how much the public is interested financially, and we will adjust the project accordingly. We are not, there's kind of two forms of crowdfunding that are going on right now. Uh, one is very much about hitting the lottery and getting a million dollars from your crowdsourcing. And the other is actually working to make a game. Um, you can see the difference in these two things in the slightly growing number of not delivered projects from crowdfunding. Um, whereas we are not particularly seeking, and in some ways don't particularly want to sell 100,000 copies in the crowdsource mode. We'd rather sell that vast majority of copies once the game is released. Um, and it allows us to make the game, and that's what we're aiming for. We go to the public asking for the money to make a game. Um, and how much they participate dictates how big of a game it'll be. I see. So, from what you've experienced through uh, crowdfunding and such, do you... Yeah. Do you feel like um, you've allowed players and funders, I suppose, to have more of a say in how the game is made? Oh, definitely. Definitely. They get much more feedback at a much earlier point. Um, because feedback is difficult. People tend to have the idea that they can roll up on the day of game release and say, you should change it from being a game about ducks to a game about horses. It's like, there's not a lot of time left to make that change. Sorry. <laughs> I, I know this hand. might be um, something of a touchy subject, but uh, what you just said kind of uh, relates back to the release of Sword of the Stars 2. Right. Uh, what would you have to say about that? Uh, how that was handled? I would like to say I would have had a lot more control of the situation if I could have. Mm -hmm. And I think we can leave it at that. I see. As certainly the release of uh, the pit and ground pounders shows clearly what we do when it's in our control. And this, uh, determining the scope of the game is allows you to succeed more, you say? No, nope. reliability of uh, support is what allows me I to see. make a game. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yep, there are many things that did not work out the way they were supposed to. And uh, that's part of what kind of moved us along this path. Because it was clear that in the end, in this day and age, only the people making the game really care about that sort of thing all the way through a project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you could, uh, money and time permitting, would you go back to making another space combat game like Sword of the Stars? Oh, definitely. And I will, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just. You have to remember that I made space games nonstop for. 10 years. Right? Why should you stop now? Right. And also taking a little break right now is, is good for me creatively. But uh, oh no, don't never fear. We will return to space when the time is right. There'll be no doubts about that. We own the Sword of the Stars IP. Mm. In my discussion with Martin about crowdfunding, his opinion reflects a desire to have control of every aspect of the game's development. So it is unsurprising that Kerberos has moved away from having a publisher partner. Paradox in a Reddit AMA said that Sword of the Stars 2 was a very complicated issue, and one of the reasons that it was released in such a state was that it had been delayed already, and it needed to be released or killed. Whether or not the reason behind the delays is the fault of Kerberos or Paradox, I don't know. But it is clear that the developers at Kerberos feel that they need more control over their projects, and crowdfunding gives them just that. In this way, we can see how independent developers can create games on their own terms, while at the same time letting their players get involved as well. Ground Pounders, the latest entry in the Store of the Stars series, was released, recently released on Steam, and you can find the rest of Kerberos' games on Steam as well. Next time, we'll take a more in-depth look at how modding can influence game development, as well as learn what it really means to feel lost. This has been Brian McKittrick for Lab Ventures, and thank you for listening. <laughs>